Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santonetti, and today we're talking about my favorite book, The Word of God. So if you have your iPads and you have everything before you that, you know, the Word of God, whether it's your Bible in a book form or wherever you have it, go ahead and turn to it. And we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. We've been talking about Romans chapter 8 now. I believe this is the 20th part. Um, there's so much food here in this chapter, and we're not going to stop until we complete it by the grace of God. But the whole concept of chapter 8 is that we have life in the Spirit. We have life in the Spirit. In chapter 6, we're released from the law because we have come to Christ. And Paul gives us a beautiful illustration. And he talks about, for the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So here, Paul is giving us the beautiful illustration that before Christ came and died for our sins, we were married to the law of Moses in the sense that the law condemned us because we cannot be righteous by ourselves. It won't work. There's no way in the world that you and I can be righteous by ourselves. We have nothing in us that's so righteous that we can be saved by ourselves. So when Jesus came and died on the cross, he took away the penalty of the law of God saying that he has taken now our punishment and so we are no longer married to the old man. We are married to Christ and we live in the spirit. This is basically what it was saying. So in chapter 8, Paul is telling us that he's free Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, watch this, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, while we were without Christ, we were walking in the flesh without the Spirit of God. But now that we are saved, thank you Jesus, we're walking in the Spirit, and in the law of the Spirit is being fulfilled in us every day. It tells us in verse 4 of chapter 8 of Romans that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, we're going to move on now because we talked about um, our obligation as Christians. We talked about not being carnally minded, but, you know, subject to the law of God. We talked about that those who walk in the flesh cannot please God, but those who walk in the spirit are pleasing to God. And it tells us that the body's dead because of sin, but we're alive because of the spirit. But now we left off with chapter 8 and verse 16 and 17 last week. And it talks about the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. Notice two words here, spirit. There is a capital spirit. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. There is a small s. So the big s represents the Holy Spirit where the small s represents the spirit of man. That's who we are. Remember that you are a spirit being. Okay? So that we are the children of God. And if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co- and, excuse me, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, we suffer with him that we may be also glorified with him. So here, remember, people who are not saved, they don't suffer with Christ. They suffer because of this world, because of sin, because of our fallen nature. But when you come to Christ and you become a Christian, that means to be like Christ, you are suffering for the sake of Christ. I hope you are, <laughs> because sometimes we suffer, but it's not for the sake of Christ, because we are joined to him. So now let's look at verse 18 
as we look in our teaching today, we're in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now think about this. If we're really the children of God, adopted by His grace, we're no longer under the penalty of the law, although we want to fulfill the law, it should be a desire for us to keep the law, we're no longer under the penalty of the law, but the freedom of the Spirit and the law is being fulfilled in us because Christ took our sins upon Himself. Now think about this now also. The grace that saved us leads us in a particular direction. It leads us to Christ. We're protected under His care and He supplies everything that we need to walk in the liberty of of the children of God. How beautiful. How beautiful. So we're long, we're no longer bound by fear of death. We're no longer separated from God. We're no longer condemned because we share in the righteousness of God and the law does not condemn us. But again, I want to say, Paul also said that the law of God is holy. And therefore, we should have a desire to want to walk in the holiness of God according to His Word. And this is the only way we could do this. We can do this only because the Spirit of God is in us. But remember that if we're suffering, what we keep in mind is the sufferings that Jesus went through Himself when He died upon the cross. Everything that He went through. As a matter of fact, I did a study on the redemption before the cross. And you say, I thought the cross is the place where we got saved. The cross is the final place, the seal of everything Jesus went through before that. Remember, he was whipped. He was beaten. He was spit upon. He was slapped. His beard was pulled. They put a crown of thorns and took a, a, a rod, a stick, and beat it into his head. Think about this. They wrapped him in, uh, uh, um, in, in a robe and mocked him. All of these things. Then, you know, they led him to the cross and they nailed his hands and his feet on that cross. That was the seal. That was the place. It is done. Even he said it when he was on the cross. It is finished. And it says, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Now think about this. What about you and I as, as believers? We're led to that place. You know, we before we die, we, we're going to go through sufferings in this world. The whippings, the beatings, whatever God chooses for us, we can do nothing about that. But he gives us grace. And you know what I love about the cross Jesus carried his cross, but then the Bible says he fell and they got another man to carry his cross. And you know what? You're always going to find people along the way that are going to help you follow, to carry your cross. Isn't that beautiful? You, you don't have to do this by yourself. Even when you think you're by yourself, you're never by yourself. You say, I'm suffering. I'm so by myself. You're never by yourself because Peter tells us that the children of God, your brothers and sisters, are going through the same trials too. And I love that. I remember as a young Christian, I was going through a lot. I came out of a lot. I was deep, 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 deep in sin. All kinds of stuff. But when I came out of that and God began to clean my heart and my life, I was going through a lot of changes while that cleansing was happening. But you know what? I always remembered that I had brothers and sisters that were going through the same trials too. And man, there were times when I couldn't take it. I would run to the church and I was so glad that it was open and just to be around the saints, just to be around a brother. Oh man, it was so comfortable. You knew that you were in a safe place. And I love that. You, you got to know that your brothers and sisters they are a refuge for you too. That's why when people say, I don't got to go to church. I don't got to go to church to know God. Well, no, not really. 
but you got to be with the saints to get that security, to get that place where you say, wow, I am not alone. There are other people who are going through the same trials too. And that's the beautiful part of it. So when we look at what Paul is teaching us here, he says, if we suffer with him, I reckon, he says, <laughs> I reckon. He says, I count it. I suppose. I charge it. He says, the conclusion is that everything that we suffer in this world, and the word suffering is, is, is a very you know, a very deep word too, because it's talking about affliction, affections, motions. I mean, everything. When we suffer, everything. If someone hits your toe, the whole body hurts. And there are times you're going through depression. There are times that you might go through poverty. There are times that you may go through people mocking you and even beating you. But the fact is that we have a path. Even though there's hardship, even though we're undergoing through some serious affliction, God is faithful. He will never give you more than you can handle. But the fact is, He will give you grace. He will make a way out so that you can stand up under it. You know, people try to avoid hardships and they go, they try to go around it. But the Christians go through it. Why? Because God makes us so strong that we can hold up under under the affliction, under the pain, under the emotional stress, under the mockings. We can stand under it just like Jesus. The Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the opposition of the cross. Oh man, for the joy, what joy? He knew that he would die. He knew that he would resurrect he knew that he would go to the right hand of the Father where nothing could touch him anymore. He knew it. And for the joy of this, that you and I would be saved through that death, through that resurrection. It was his joy to say, I'm willing to die. I'm willing to suffer because I know many are going to get saved. And you and I should have that same attitude that when we're going through something, it is not just for us. It is for somebody else to benefit from that. Your hardships, your pains, your emotions, or you know your sufferings, your misfortunes, your calamities, whatever we go through when we're suffering all this evil, we have a hope. And the hope is this, that Christ in us is the hope of glory. Hallelujah to that. So our external sufferings are deep. Oh, yeah. But our internal joy is deeper still. That nothing can separate us from this love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So also remember, Christians must undergo in behalf of the same cause which Christ patiently endured. Why? It's an inward state. It's an inward state. Our joy, our strength is inward. And we can stand and rejoice. Look what Colossians 1.24 says, who now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind of the aff afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul is speaking about the sufferings. Remember, Paul went through some stuff. Paul went through sufferings. I mean, you're talking about a man who was whipped a few times he was in the water. A few times he got bit by a snake. He was persecuted by the Jews, his own brethren. He was persecuted by people. He was standing before Caesar. They wanted to kill this man, but God was with him to the point that he even says this, everyone abandoned me, but Christ was by my side. I love that. Oh, praise God. Like I said, you are not alone. You belong to Christ and he has you tightly in his hands. And look what he says this in John chapter 17, verse 22. And the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. Folks, I got to tell you something. I want you to understand this and get it in your Noah. God knows 
<laughs> he knows your suffering. It's in his Noah. He knows what you're going through. He understands it completely. But we are not just united with Christ, but we're united with his sufferings. There's a verse of scripture that comes to mind, and I'm going to go there because it is powerful. And I remember reading this, so I'm going to go there. And it was um, in Matthew. And what was interesting is when a woman came to Jesus. It was the the mother of, of Zebedee's children, James and John. She came with her, with her sons and she was worshiping him as she's coming. What that looked like, I don't know. Maybe she was shouting, she, whatever she was doing. She came worshiping to Jesus and desiring a certain thing of him. So she worshiped, but she had an agenda in her mind. And he said to her, what will you want? What is it that you want? She said unto them, Grant that these my sons may sit, the one on your right hand and the other on your left hand in the kingdom. And look what Jesus tells her. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We are able to do that. And look what he says, You shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and on my left, it's not for me to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. You know, those two people that were uh, the two thieves that were crucified by Christ and him being in the middle, that was preordained by God. That one would reject him and the other one would accept him. So imagine if John and James would have taken that place, one would have rejected him and the other one would have, would have accepted him. But you know what? When he says, you're going to drink of this cup. Oh, you open your mouth. Oh, yeah, we're able to take this cup, Christ. We're able to deal with this. You know what he said? You, you are. James got his head chopped off. And John, according to history, got boiled in oil, put on the island of Patmos where he got the revelation. You see, God has a different suffering for all of us. Some you are fewer than others. Thank God. But some, they go through stuff, and I've seen some saints go through, you know, some pain and suffering. Uh, I, I mean, husband leaves their wife, their children. She has to leave the house because they can't afford that. I mean, you name it, and then uh, two of her children got sick. You name it. I saw it. I said, wow. One of the children got so sick as he's coughing up blood. He's saying, I want to die. But God said, you're not going to die. And today, he's alive. He's in the service, and his whole desire of vision for life was to be a police captain. I don't know where he's going to land, but I know that God has a plan for him. And I'll tell you something else. One day he's going to stand and tell of his sufferings, and it's going to be glorious. And he's going to say, everything that I have now cannot compare. The sufferings that I went through cannot compare with the glory that I'm having with Christ now. You see, everything that you and I go through is for a reason, my brothers and my sisters. And for that, for that cause, should we do one thing? I'll tell you what we should do. We should take it and say, God, you are the Lord. I am nothing. You are the King. I am nothing. You suffered. I suffered nothing compared to what you went through. But remember, we have an expectation of hope, which we're going to be talking about in the next segment. But remember, while you're going through this world, Christ is holding you close. He's holding you tightly in his hand. And he promised in John chapter 10, verse 28, all that the Father give unto me, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and nothing can snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, 
and the Father which is greater than every man, and nothing can snatch them out of his hand. Folks, that is called a double security where the Father and the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit has you covered and nothing can get in between the hands of God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit to snatch you out. Wow, your salvation has been secured by the blood of Christ. And no matter what you go through, you are victorious more than a conqueror. God bless you. And until we meet again, shalom.